Okay, okay, so I lied, all right? At the conclusion of yesterday's episode, I said that I really wasn't inclined to try to get into figuring out how the power play might look if Eric Carlson comes along. Well, I lied. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. You know, this doesn't have to be a Carlson-themed episode. It doesn't. He makes it convenient because if he's added... There's no way you keep him off the top power play unit. No way! Just as there's no way you'd keep Chris Letang off it. Just as there's no way you'd keep Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin. And if you're being realistic here, because he is the team's leading goal scorer, you're probably not keeping Jake Gensel off it. So what do you have? You have five guys... The one who gets bumped, Ricard Raquel, I would argue, was one of the more explosive power play guys that the Penguins had this past season once Mike Sullivan and Todd Reardon finally put him out there with the main guys. But you try to keep this realistic to an extent. Carlson comes. Carlson's on the point. Latang's on the other point. Gino moves up. Can Gino handle that? That's where you start. I guess an easy, lazy answer to that is, well, of course. Not only is he a natural centerman, but that's where he's produced probably, what, 90% of all his points? There's nothing that he can't do. But where it gets more complex is what exactly would he be doing and would you take away some of his innate ability to keep the other team's penalty killing units unsettled with all of the extra unpredictable, wild, imaginative, roaming all over the attacking zone stuff that he likes to do. You'd probably be handcuffing him pretty well there. So let's just put him on the left wing for right now and just leave him there while we try to figure out the rest. Sid fancies himself a half-wall guy. He's a better uh, goal line end boards guy than he is on the half wall. He's also really, really good at A, tips and deflections, and B, just kind of taking out the trash from that far post. And you know what I'm talking about. If someone has the puck on the left side, left wall, remember Phil Kessel used to do this all the time. Man, did Phil just own the power play. He's out there with all these living legends and just controlling play. Amazing what he used to do off of that left wall. But Sid's over there, and he's waiting, and he's really, really good at that stuff. Okay, let's do that. Let's just put Sid there and leave him there. Now, what you have left is Jake, but also the stark realization that you don't have a more traditional net front guy. And I understand the days are long past of, you know, a Paul Gardner, Tim Kerr, John LeClaire type being there, but you still have a prototype. You still have someone that you want there causing trouble and presenting a big human screen for the goaltender to deal with. And I'm not sure that that's on the roster. We've seen at times Raquel will go to the net. He's certainly not shy about it, but we also haven't seen that he's done it in a way where you say, ah, yeah, this guy was born to be a net front presence on the first power play. We've seen the stuff that Raquel is good at on the power play, and I think that's why he should stay there. But again, we're trying to deal with realism here in this scenario. How does it work? How does it function? How does it dovetail with the things that Carlson does well? You know what Carlson does well? Probably better than anything else that he does. And he does it better than any defenseman I think I've ever seen at this specific skill. And that's finding forwards anywhere 
in the attacking zone and setting them up with glorious chances. He was, this past season, among other great things that he achieved individually in San Jose with 101 points, he led the NHL's defensemen, all of them, in successful passes into the slot. It's one of those advanced stats, but if you think about it, it's really not all that advanced. It's just what it sounds like. Dude's open between the hash marks. You find a way to get it to him. He's number one. The best. I don't know how far back they've been keeping that stat, but I'll bet it could go back to his first year in Ottawa that he'd be leading the league in that because I've never seen anybody better. Not in Pittsburgh, not anywhere in the NHL. Well, if you're making the effort that Kyle Dubas clearly is to get Carlson and you bring him in, you'd better be equipped, even hypothetically, with that answer right now. Not for the purposes of a Friday morning podcast, but for the purposes of, you know, running the franchise. You'd better be thinking this very second. Who Carlson can get that puck to? And what happens when he does? Is he feeding Gino in there? Well, a righty passing to a lefty. Gino has to catch the puck on his forehand. Turn It doesn't really work. It's better if it's a righty. Okay. Who's the righty up front? Wait. None. Sid, Gino, Jake. All lefties. Huh. Okay. What if you were to try to do something completely different? What if you were to try to engineer some sort of half-wall presence? Tell Gino, we're going to do something just maybe I mean, he's done it before. He's done it in the past. Usually when Sid was injured, he'd go to the right half-wall and set up over there, which is really nice to use his shot, but it's not something that he's generally been great at from the passing standpoint. He tends to believe too much in his passing ability at times, if that makes sense. He thinks all of his passes are just going to find a way through, and, you know, they don't. But if you have him over there, and you have... Remember the Flyers' old setup on the power play? For those of you who are really, really puckheads, where the Flyers would have up front Claude Giroux, Jakub Voracek, and Wayne Simmons, and you had two righties and a lefty, and these guys would do nothing other than, yeah, you can picture it, right? Nothing other than just whip lateral passes through the box pretty much as hard as they could and just go for the slammed one-timer. And it was a difficult thing to stop when those guys were in their prime, in large part because nobody else was doing it. Here again, tough to do in Pittsburgh. Two right-handed shots on the points and three lefties up front. Okay, so I didn't get anywhere, and I'm not going to. I'm sorry. I guess I lied again. (laughs) Maybe at least I illustrated what a challenge this would be. When we come back, J1Q. J1Q comes from Adam. But Adam, if you'll forgive me, I want to hijack the beginning of this segment because during the break there, I gave it a little bit of extra thought. And I'm not ready to completely throw in the towel on this power play because there's just too much talent out there. There's just too much. There, there's just, and there's too much will. So here's the concession that I've got. If you think about the playoff version, this is plural, of Sid and Gino, you will think of guys that are just throwing themselves at the net, doing anything and everything to chase that puck to make sure that it's uh, being screened, sought out, retrieved to get back to the points. If you had Sid and Gino in roles where they understood, hey, listen, we've got two guys, one in particular, who are just unbelievable at getting the puck down low. We've had three, four years of this power play just screwing around and not shooting enough. We're going to tell 65 out there on the right point to do nothing other than flick the puck to the net. You're either going to be there 
or you're not. We're all either going to treat this coming season as a final chance to win a Stanley Cup or we're not. That that I could see working. That plus Raquel out there instead of Jake. Because you do need somebody who's big, swift, strong, and whatever, particularly for retrieval along the boards. There, that's all I got for you. Okay, here's your question now, Adam. Adam wants to know, this is pretty simple stuff. How's that GM search coming along? Isn't it funny? Like, whenever the Kyle Dubas search was still in play, we were all like, every day, the Dubas search, day 14, day 17, and it seemed so intensive. He comes along, he gets named president of hockey operations, claims that he's going to hire a GM while also acknowledging that he's going to still be running things. He then brings in his old pal Jason Spezza, his surrogate in Toronto, to come in here and be assistant GM. So Spezza is now assistant GM to nobody in much the same spirit that Dwight Schrute was assistant to the regional manager. Or was Michael the... Was Michael Scott the regional manager? I thought he was just the manager of that particular branch in Scranton. Anyway, it's not going to happen. It's, I really don't think it's going to happen. I don't think this team's going to have a GM. If it does, if it does, and, and in fairness here, Dubas wasn't pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. He did say at the time, it's not a priority. They were about to enter into the draft. They were about to enter into free agency, and he's making the decisions anyway. So if he brings a GM in, it's going to be somebody, I believe, that's going to come with a specific set of guidelines, something that he or she is responsible for. That might be development, although I think that would be more in Spetz's domain. It might be something like the draft. It might be something like the salary cap. It might be overseeing analytics and assuring that there's a steady communication stream between analytics and your old guard hockey people to make sure that their work isn't being wasted, while at the same time listening to the hockey people who will say, I have absolutely no use for this particular data, and then asking why. That might be a role that you come up with. But overall, the idea that there's still a GM to be hired, regardless of what the title will say, that's just not going to happen. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody who listens to Daily Shot of Penguins. We will be back with another one Monday. And I swear it's not going to be about this power play. I swear. 